Thanks for the nice introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you all woke up after a brief coffee break. My name is Rose Xu. I'm working at the Office of Manufacturing Process Assessment. Today, I want to share with you the reporting categories when reporting a post-approval change. And my talk will focus mostly on the changes to manufacturing process and facilities. I'm sure everybody is very familiar with processing validation. There are three stages in process validation. The first stage is process design, where the commercial manufacturing process is defined during this stage based on knowledge gained through the development and scale up activities. At the stage two, which is the process qualification, during this stage, the process design is evaluated to determine if the process is capable of reproduce the commercial manufacturing. And then comes for the stage three. This is the continued process verification stage. At this stage, the drug product has already been approved and manufacturing is uh, going to the production stage. Production stage. Ongoing assurance is gained during this routine production that the process is operating in a state of control. Most of the post-approval changes occurred at this stage. So today I'm focusing on this stage three, continued processing verification. According to uh, CFR 211-180E for the small molecule and 60112 for large molecules, the firm has to evaluate the performance of the process by correcting and analyzing product and process data that are related to product quality. After evaluation, uh, the firm needs to identify problems and determine whether action must be, take, must be taken to correct, anticipate, and prevent problems so that the process remains in control. After all this, um, if there are changes, then um, the firm has to report it according to 3.1470 and Section 506, 506A. All the post-approval changes need to be reported. Here, I just list a few guidances that FDA issued to the pharmaceutical industry, which are related to the post-approval changes. I'm sure everyone has already familiar with all these guidance. I just list a few examples. The first one actually is most um, used, which is the changes to an approved NDA or ANDA. This guidance basically talk about all the uh, changing categories. And also um, there's another one is reportable CMC changes for the approved um, drug or biological product. And um, we also have another one talking about changes in annual that can be reported in annual reports. And um, there's another one that's specific for biological products that need to be uh, that can be reported in annual report. And again, don't forget the short pack guidances. There are several short pack guidance. And um, when you're reporting the scale up, please go in the short pack guidance and take a detailed look. Um, I would like to um, touch briefly about the reporting categories. Um, you may already know that there are three reporting categories. For any major changes, it should be reported in prior approval changes. For moderate changes, you can enter this report in either CVE 30 or CVE 0. CBE 30 means that the changes will be effective in 30 days after they are submitted. And CBE 0 means that the changes are effective right away. And those are usually the minor changes. So FDA, FDA reviews the changes and find if this change is a major change, then we will send an email a letter within 30 days of receipt of this sub of this um, supplement and tell the company um, that um, a PAS is needed for this change. For a change that is reported in CVE zero, after FDA reviews that a change need to be um, a major change, a change is a major change, then a, a PAS should be submitted. In this case, the manufacturing should cease distribution of drug product made using this disapproved change. And there are also some minor changes that the company can report that in the annual report, according to 31470D. So there would be many different changes after an application is approved. For example, uh, the changes might have made on uh, components and the composition, 
and sometimes the firm decided to move the manufacturing site, and also um, there might be a modification in manufacturing process. Uh, those are all need to be reported. And also, um, there could be a slightly modification on the drug product specifications, or even change the container and closure systems. Uh, labeling changes um, see very often, so um, that is another one. And also, there's uh, all sorts of uh, you know changes like multiple related changes that um, you have to review this case by case. So in today's talk, I will focus on the manufacturing sites and the manufacturing process. I think uh, Ramesh um, has already talked about uh, some changes um, on the components and the composition, specifications, and the container closure system. So changes in manufacturing sites. I will first talk about a change that uh, when moving to a different site for a non-sterile product. Then I will talk about a uh, moving to a different area within the same sites. Again, this is for a non-sterile product. And lastly, I would like to talk about the side change for a sterile products, as that is more complicated and a lot of um, changes um, can be reported in different reporting category. Before um, I move that, I would like to um, get clear on the definition of a manufacturing site. Of course, we already know that anything that involved in manufacturing is a manufacturing site. Any site that involves manufacturing is a manufacturing site. But here, I'm mainly talking about five sites. The first one is the drug product manufacturer. The second one is drug substance manufacturer. The third one is drug substance intermediate manufacturer. We talk about more is about critical intermediate manufacturer. And the fourth one is the testing site, which include sites for final release testing, in processing testing, or the stability testings. And lastly, don't forget the packaging and the labeling sites. So all these five um, category of sites needs to be reported to FDA if there are any changes. Move to a different site for a non-sterile product. Many of you might already know that if the new site has a previous acceptable inspection history, usually a CVE 30 can be filed. However, if that new site does not have a previous inspection history for the type of operations being approved, for example, the new site is approved for a tablet, and now uh, you are moving a solution manufacturing to this solution product to this site, then you should submit a PAS. And of course, for a site that has never been inspected by FDA, you should file a PAS. So um, based on the complexity, the reporting category could be different. Um, for example, if this is a drug substance intermediate manufacturer, even though there's no inspection history, you can still um, submit it as a CVE 30. And in this table, um, I list um, some um, changes in processing material. So please keep in mind that if there's change um, involved in, in processing material, and that is for the modified release solid dosage form, or depot drug products, or transdermal systems, or that involve a liposomal drug products, or oral nasal metal dosed inhalers, or dry powder inhalers, or drug products with, with nasal spray pumps, those changes need to be reported in PAS as those are complicated um, process and we think the risk is high. Therefore, it, uh, we think it's a major change and we need to review more detail. If the new site has an acceptable compliance history, the reporting category could be different. For example, if it is a primary packaging site for solid dosage form, including modified release package, uh, release form, then a CVE 30 is enough. If moved to a different testing site for approved testing, then CVE 30 can be submitted. And if you fulfill a post-approval commitment, again, a CVE 30 can be submitted. However, um, if uh, this new site is only for secondary packaging, or this new site is only for a laboring site, or for the drug substance intermediate, other than the final intermediate, uh, those can all report it in the annual report, including a new contract sterilization sites for packaging components 
or the new size for the ink, ink for the ink imprinting of the solid dosage form. So those can be reported in the annual report. If the manufacturing side change is for a sterile product, either a CBE 30 or PAS can be submitted, depend on the change. So the first one, um, I will focus on moving to a different site. So if this is a, a septically processed sterile drug substance or drug product manufacturing site with product codes SVS or SVL, moving to a new site needed to submit a PAS. If this drug product was terminal sterilization process, and this is the first time for this site to receive such type of the process, then you should submit a PAS. Once this SVT, um, the terminal sterilization process in this new site is approved, subsequent supplement, supplements can be submitted as CBE 30. So what happened if the move is just to a new constructed building or area within the same existing facility? So for, a aseptically, for an aseptically processed sterile drug product, if the firm is adding a new filling line and that new filling line have similar approved drug product, similar principle, then you can submit a CBE 30. However, if you're changing the container types or size, for example, you decided to um, change from the vial filling to a syringe filling, or you decided to, instead of filling a five mil vial, you decided to switch to a one mil filling vial, then you should submit a PAS. For a drug product with terminal sterilization process, the profile code is SVT in this case. If this new area or new constructed building do not have an approved SVT product, you have to submit PAS. However, if this new area already have FDA approved SVT products, then submitted an annual report is enough. Now I want to switch my gear to the changes in manufacturing process. Again, I wanted to talk about the changes for a non-sterile product, then for a sterile product, um, for a sterile product, I will first focus on the changes that may affect the sterility assurance. And then um, I will talk a little bit more about changes related to the equipment only. Changes in manufacturing process for a non-sterile product. If the change that may affect in the control to release meters or other characters of the dose delivery, then a PAS should be submitted. If there's a fundamental change in drug product, drug substance manufacturing process, again, a PAS should be submitted. If that process change made after the final intermediate um, processing step in drug substance manufacture, we think that is a major change. And again, um, a PAS should be submitted. Um, so if the firm is adding an ink code imprint or change to a new ink that never have been approved, um, you should submit a PAS. However, if that ink has already been used in an approved drug product, you can report in that change in the annual report. So what else for the um, PAS submissions? PAS, uh, submissions? Uh, the first one is the change in establishing a new procedure for reprocessing or change in the synthesis or manufacturing of a drug substance. We think those um, are the major changes. Therefore, a PAS should be submitted. But if you are changing a production skill, um, usually a CBE 30 is enough. However, um, I encourage everybody to check the short pack guidance as there are different levels of change depending on what levels um, the submission type, the reporting category could be different. So go to the short pack guidance before uh, you submit a change on production scale. Um, also, there are some change that can be reported in uh, CBE0. Uh, that is change in method or controls that provided increased, ass increased assurance. That can be reported in the CBE0. Or you are replacing an equipment with the same design uh, that is even in low risk. So you can report that in the annual report. For sterile products, any changes that may affect sterility assurance 
uh, should be submitted um, as a PAS. Um, I here I just list several examples. Um, we should go one by go through one by one. So the first one is changing in the sterilization method. The second one is addition or deletion or substitution of sterilization steps or procedures for handling sterile materials. Also, if you are changing from by burden based terminal sterilization to the use of an overkill process, we think that is the risk is high as well and you need to do validation, uh, you should submit it as a PAS. If changing to a septical processing methods, including scales or ex extend the total processing time by more than 50%, which is beyond the validation limits that already established in the approved application, then you should submit a PAS or changing in sterilizer loading configurations that are outside of the validation roads, or even changing in material or pore size rating of that filters. All those changes we think that the, um, may affect the sterility assurance is consider, um, are considered a, uh, major changes and should be reported in PAS. Now let's review the changes related to equipment for a sterile product. Again, replacing um, sterile sterilizer with different operation principle, we think the um, risk is higher and that may affect the sterility assurance. A PAS should be submitted, or if adding a new acceptable processing line made with different materials, or you are replacing a existing class 100 acceptable field area filling area with a barrier system or isolator for acceptable filling that risk is also higher and need to do a processing validation and we do need to review the data therefore a PS is needed or you are replacing or adding of a line authorization equipment all this listed here need to be submitted in a PS so now I wanted to talk about changes in manufacturing process that involve a nature product um, so if that changes is in a virus or adventitious agent removal or inactivation method, or even that changes in the source materials, for example, the microorganisms, plant, or the cell lines, or you are establish a new master cell bank or seeds, all those change are major changes and should submit a PAS. So here I list um, the examples of reporting category. Uh, the first uh, ex few examples is focusing on manufacturing process change. So a firm submitted a PAS for changes made on the drug product manufacturing from wet granulation to a dry granulation. Do you think is this the right reporting category? The answer is yes. If they are make changes on the drug product from wet granulation to dry granulation, uh, the risk is higher. Therefore, we think that a PAS is appropriate. And the second one, a firm submitted a CBE 30 for changes uh, for changing the dry process from fruit bed to an urban dry with trees. That is for a tablet. So what the reporting category are uh, you think CBE 30 is sufficient? The answer is no. We actually denied that CBE study to a PAS, as that drying processing from fruit bed to urban dry is a major change and might involve some risk. Therefore, um, we consider this risk is higher and should be submitted at PAS. The third example is the firm submitted a CBE zero for a changing an existing code imprint from numeric to alpha numeric code. So you think CVE0 is the right reporting category to report? Yes, it is. However, since the risk is low, uh, you can even report this in the annual report. So here are more examples of reporting categories. Uh, this time, those changes are made on the manufacturing process for a sterile product. I will focus, I take actually a few examples on the filtration and filter. Um, so the first one is the firm made a change on the filtration parameters for a septical process, including flow rate, pressure, time, or volume. What reporting category do you think that the firm should submit? The answer is 
CVE 30. The second example, the firm made a change on the filter materials or pore size rating. So what reporting category in this type of change? The answer is PAS. I actually talked about this change in the previous slide when I'm talking about PAS change for a sterile product. The third example is that the firm is eliminating in-process filtration performed as part of the terminally, terminally sterilized drug product. So what a reporting category this one's supposed to be? CVE0. So you probably would be surprised why this change involves a sterile product and it only need to be reported in CBE0. As we think that since the terminal sterilization is conducting a final step, so anyway, this um, process has some type of assurance, sterility assurance. Therefore, um, if you eliminate in process infiltration, um, that risk is kind of lower and the CVE0 should be appropriate. Now I want to put a few examples on the reporting category for a code imprint as I received several email um, about this what reporting category for this type of change. So the first one is addition or deletion of a code imprint by embossing, debossing or engraving on a modified release solid dosage form. And the second one is the same change, however this time is not on the modified solid, uh, modified release dosage form, but the other um, tablets. Uh, the third one is addition of a ink code imprint, or you make some change on the current ink, use that existing product. Um, however, this um, new ink has never been used on a CEDAR approved drug product. So what are the reporting category you think for each of this change? Let's take a look of the answer. The first one actually is supposed to be submitted a PS, as we think that adding or deleting of this current code imprint might change the modified release. Therefore, the risk is higher. A PAS is more appropriate. The second one, it can be reported in annual report, as this is not a modified release dosage form. Therefore, the risk is lower. The third one, um, of course, that new ink has never been used in an cedar approved product that's why we think that we don't know the risk we do need to do a more careful review a pas is needed so now i want to share with you a few case study the first case study is that the firm submitted a cve 30 for moving the packaging line to a new site for a tablet product during the supplement review it was fine that in addition to the bottle package, the firm actually added the Bristol package. And also we noticed that the new site has never been approved for the Bristol packaging corporate in uh, production. So what do you think that the reporting category should be for this type of change? Is that CVE 30 appropriate? The answer is no. We actually denied that CVE 30 and asked the firm to submit a PAS. The reason is that the Bristol package has never been um, used or approved in the current production. Again, this new site has never been approved for that Bristol packaging production. Therefore, combine these two, and we think that CVE 30, uh, CVE 30 is not appropriate. Instead, a PAS should be submitted. Let's take a look of the case study number two. So in this case, a firm submitted a CVE 30 for moving the release testing of a sterile product to a new site that has been inspected by agency. While reviewing this inspection history of this new site, we noticed that this new site has only been approved for chemical testing, which has a profile LCP. While the um, current release testing for this um, drug product, including microbiology testing that has the profile LMN and the sterility testing, the profile is LMS. Those testing were not covered during the previous inspections. So do you think a CVE 30 is appropriate for the reporting category in this case? Let's take a look at the answer. No. CVE 30 actually is denied to a PAS, 
as the LMN and LMS, these two testing have never been inspected in the previous inspection. Therefore, we need to start a new inspection. EPAS is appropriate for this reporting category. Now I would like to share with everybody the third case study. So in this case, um, due to a new OAI status on the existing testing lab, uh, the applicant decided to submit a CVE-30 to remove, uh, to move this XRPD testing to another contract testing site. And this contract testing site has been inspected for conducting the chemical testing. However, during the review, we noticed that the new site has never performed XRPD testing. So we make a call to the new site and confirm that there is not even equipment ready on site to perform that test. So of course, uh, we put this supplement in withhold. So this is not a type of um, review category. The firm submitted CVE-30, but we have to put this supplement into withhold. So the take home message basically is that it is the applicant's responsibility to check if this new site has the capability of conducting the test or if the new site is ready for that test. Now let's um, move to the next step, which is the challenge questions. This is always the fun part. Let's see if um, everybody pay attention to my talk. So the first one is, um, what reporting category the sponsor should use if a lyophilized drug product is moved to a new site and A, the new site has never been inspected by agency, B, the new site has no previously approved lyophilized products, C, the new site has previously approved to manufacture lyophilized drug product but with a different container type or size. The answer is PAS for all three. Now challenge question number two. What reporting category the sponsor should use if the sponsor is replacing an existing wet granulator to A, a different model with different designs that does not affect the processing methodology or process operating parameters? B, the exactly same model. Let's take a look over the answer. So the first one, um, it should be submitted a CVE-30. The second one, since it's the same model, therefore it can be reported in the annual report. So that's concluded my talk today. I would like to thank you Vivian Pai and Ying Zhang who gave me a lot of good advice when I'm preparing the slides. So any questions?